We're excited to be back in, in Polk County. I want to thank Sheriff Grady Judd for hosting us here. Um, you know, Grady, it's funny, you know, people in Florida, like, they're proud of their sheriffs in many counties, but particularly here in Polk, and they have debates about, you know, who's, uh, who's the best sheriff in Florida. And I would say, by extension, that means the best sheriff in America, right? Um, and, and someone told me, like, you know, it's not normal that people are so proud of their sheriffs. Uh, that they're always debating that, and that's that's what we see here in Florida. In fact, there's people in other states that that debate who the best sheriff in Florida is. But Grady has really set the standard, and I'm proud to call him a friend. We're also here with Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez, our Attorney General Ashley Moody, uh, Representative Kyan Michael uh, from Northeast Florida, and then Nikki Jones, uh, who's an angel wife. We also have Representative Benny Jocks. I saw. Where's Benny at? Um, thank you for what you're doing. Um, we also have Representative Plankin and Representative Bell. Uh, so we appreciate you all and all your great support. Um, so we're here today, one, to build off a record of success with respect to combating illegal immigration. And if you think about it, if you go back six or seven years in the state of Florida, we were not leading against illegal immigration at all. In fact, we were one of the weaker states with respect to illegal immigration. Uh, since we've come in, uh, we've done things like ban sanctuary cities throughout the state of Florida. Those were legal in this state prior uh, to, to me taking office. Uh, we've also worked to enact harsh penalties for people that are bringing fentanyl into our community. 99% of the time, it's coming across the border. Uh, we make sure in Florida not to do things like sanctuary jurisdictions do, such as issuing driver's licenses to illegal aliens. That is not allowed in the state of Florida. Uh, we also make sure that you're eligible to work to be here with using things like E-Verify. Uh, that's a magnet that brings in a lot of illegal immigration if you allow an illegal workforce. So the legislature passed last year and I signed uh, E-Verify legislation. We also understood that, yes, Florida does not allow driver's license, but you had some local jurisdictions that were trying to issue, quote, picture IDs or community IDs to people here illegally. NGOs, non-government organizations were trying to do that. So we passed legislation that I signed that said, no, you're not allowed to issue any type of ID uh, to illegal aliens, uh, including our local governments and our non-governmental organizations. And so the package that we did last year with the help of Cayenne and Blaze Angolia and many other people in the House and Senate, even the New York Times admitted was the strongest immigration legislation in the entire country. So we're proud of that. We're proud that we have really stepped up to uh, you know, empower people like Grady Judd to keep uh, his community safe here in Polk County. You know, if you look at statistics, I think Polk County has the biggest numerical increase in population of any county uh, in Florida, certainly one of them. Uh, this, you, I mean, like I grew up, you know, it's uh, west of here, but like anyone that grew up in central Florida, a Polk was viewed as, as very rural even 30 years ago. Now it's just booming, but part of the reason that's the case is because people know if you move to Florida, you're going to be treated well, but if you move to Polk, uh, they're serious about law and order, and people want to be safe, and so that's really something that's been great. So we're proud of that, but we don't like to just sit and rest on our laurels. So I'm here today to be able to sign uh, three great pieces of legislation, make some comments on another Senate memorial that was passed, and then give an update on what we're doing to uh, prevent uh, illegal vessels from coming and landing to Florida from places like Haiti. First, uh, HB 1589, uh, 1589. What you see is, yes, we don't give driver's license to illegal aliens, which you shouldn't. We don't recognize driver's license from other states that have been issued to illegal aliens, so that's smart. Uh, but you still have people that, that come and drive uh, without a license. One of the m biggest deterrents we can do for illegal immigration is to make sure people that are doing that are facing serious consequences. And so that's what that bill does. It increases the maximum sentence for people who are driving illegally uh, without a license and even provides uh, mandatory sentences for repeat offenders. Uh, this is going to be a deterrent for illegal immigration into the state of Florida. 
you come here, you're not getting a license, we're not recognizing your California license that you may have gotten in a sanctuary state, you're gonna come here, and then if you're driving, and you're endangering people, and Cayenne will talk about that, and other people, and this is not academic, I mean, this is something that has shattered the lives of families uh, with these folks doing what they're doing. So this is important, so I'm happy to be able to sign that. The other thing, the other second bill is Senate Bill uh, 1036, enhances penalties for a crime committed by an individual who returns to the country illegally after deportation. And what you find in some of these really significant incidents where people are getting raped or murdered is it's not only an illegal alien, but it's somebody that had already been deported from this country and then comes back uh, to commit crimes again. So in the state of Florida, uh, if you have been deported and you come to this state uh, and enter our state and you're here illegally and you commit crimes, we are throwing the book at you and you are not, you are gonna regret coming to the state of Florida. So I'm happy to sign that into law. And then the other one is House Bill 1451. So I mentioned we don't allow local governments or non-government organizations to issue any type of identification to people that are in our country illegally, uh, but we also want to make sure that they can't get a group in California to just issue them, and then our local governments are honoring that. So what this legislation does is it says uh, no jurisdiction, state or local, can recognize those types of rogue identifications that are issued uh, to illegal aliens. And so all in all, those are three very positive pieces of legislation. I'm gonna sign those in the law in a second after we hear from some of our speakers. I also just want to applaud the legislature for Senate Memorial 1020. Uh, so these memorials are calling on Congress to do certain things, are calling on the federal government. So they have called on the federal government to designate the Mexican drug cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. And I think that that would go a long way. It's something that I've supported for a long time. And they are foreign terrorist organizations because they are importing product into this country that is killing our people by the tens of thousands each and every year. Uh, finally, uh, give an update on... I recently made an announcement augmenting our resources in Southern Florida with respect to warding off a potential influx of vessels carrying illegal immigrants from places like Haiti. Uh, this is not a new operation for us. Uh, we've been uh, assisting the Coast Guard. Obviously, the Coast Guard is the primary uh, vehicle to protect the shorelines of the United States. We have supplemented that uh, throughout the years. January of 2023, I did an executive order declaring it to be a state of emergency, and we surged vessels uh, to be able to assist the Coast Guard. And so since January of 2023 uh, until this week, March of 2024, uh, our efforts have led to the interdiction of 670 vessels carrying over 13,500 illegal aliens. And so those are people that were stopped from being able to make it to Florida. Uh, those aliens get turned over to the Coast Guard and then by law, they have to repatriate them uh, to their home country. So we have a, a lot more ability uh, to stop on the sea uh, if the Coast Guard decides to dump in our, in our state, it makes it much more difficult for us because our tools aren't as good. So this has been a very successful uh, operation. And so what we decided to do, given the situation that's happening uh, in Haiti, some brutal reports that are happening, uh, we want to make sure that we're protecting Floridians. And so we have authorized additional uh, officers with the relevant agencies, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Florida Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we've also uh, augmented the National Guard, another 48 guardsmen, uh, up to 133 soldiers from the Florida State Guard, and 30 additional officers from Florida Highway Patrol, uh, four additional helicopters through the National Guard. So this is a significant augmentation. And I think the message is, is the last thing you should want to do is get on some boat and think you're going to come through from any of these islands to get to the state of Florida. The most likely scenario is you will be stopped and you will be returned to your country of origin. So it's a hazardous journey. It's not worth doing. And we have the resources uh, that are going to continue to keep the people of Florida safe. Just recently, within the last couple of weeks, and this will be uh, made public later today, uh, our Florida 
fish and wildlife officers interdicted a vessel that had 25 illegal immigrants, potential illegal immigrants from Haiti uh, in their boat, in their vessel. They had firearms, they had drugs, they had night vision gear, uh, and were, were uh, boating very recklessly, which would, would potentially endanger other folks. So that uh, vessel was, was interdicted uh, near the Sebastian Inlet. Uh, and those illegal aliens uh, were turned over to the Coast Guard for, for deportation. So uh, our folks have been doing this before we augmented this, and they're going to continue to do it. And we've got an incredible amount of resources that are now on display uh, to be able to prevent. Now, uh, what's different today than maybe in the past? Well, part of it is we have more resources that the state has been willing to put up. And this is not really our responsibility. This is the federal government's responsibility. Coast Guard uh, does, by and large, a good job, but they're undermanned. They're under-resourced. So we're filling those gaps. Uh, I think one difference now is, and we see this with our folks that we have at the border, you have people coming across the southern border from all over the world. Haitians can get to the United States easier by flying to Mexico and walking across the border. And so I, I would anticipate if flights resume, that will likely be where a lot of those folks uh, who are trying to flee, if they want to come to the United States, they're probably going to go to Mexico and then come in through the border, knowing that Biden uh, will just let everybody in. Also, I think it's important to point out, we focus on the border. We're obviously doing things to interdict these, these illegal vessels, which I think is really important. Uh, but Biden is also flouting the law by creating an illegal parole program where he flies in people from foreign countries against the law and puts them into our community. So, for example, you just had an instance where um, one of the people Biden flew in from Haiti uh, is now charged with sexually assaulting a 15-year-old with disabilities in Massachusetts. And you think to yourself, how is that protecting our people? You're putting your own, our own people at risk through violating the law, a policy that's not authorized under the law. It's a, it's a violation of parole, how that's used. And he's doing that, and it's causing a lot of problems. So yes, the border has been a huge issue. There's a lot of different ways in which this administration is flouting the law. So in Florida, we're going to continue uh, to do everything we can to protect folks and to make sure that, that this state continues to be a great state uh, to live in. Uh, we can – look, it's important to get the policy right. And uh, we've got our policy so much better today than it was six or seven years ago in the state of Florida with respect to illegal immigration. But uh, you also need to have people that are going to be implementing that policy on the ground. And you have that here in Polk County under Sheriff Grady Judd. You have it across Florida with so many great uh, sheriff's departments, police departments, and then, of course, our state agencies, all these people that have been out there uh, fortifying our coastline, fish and wildlife, uh, our, our National Guard, our State Guard, uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Florida Highway Patrol. This is, these are folks that have been doing a lot. I mean, these are the same people that respond to Hurricane Idalia and the year before Hurricane Ian. A lot of the same agencies are down at the southern border helping Texas. And, of course, they have a lot of work they do on a daily basis. And so we really appreciate uh, what people are doing who are wearing the uniform to help to, uh, to keep our community safe. So I think these bills will go a long way to, to helping make their job easier and make them even more effective. And I look forward to signing them into law uh, momentarily. But before I do that, we're going to hear from some of our speakers. So first, we're going to hear from our Lieutenant Governor, Jeanette Nunez. Well, good morning, and it's great to be here in Polk County. And I want to thank Governor DeSantis for signing these bills into law in just a few minutes. But more importantly, for his leadership on this issue of illegal immigration in particular, he's been a steadfast champion, and Floridians are better off because of him. And of course, I won't wait. Yes. <clears throat> And, of course, I won't wade into the debate of who is our best sheriff in the state of Florida. I will let the public decide that. But I do want to thank Sheriff Grady Judd for all the work he and his deputies do each and every day, particularly on the issue of combating human trafficking. Um, I know you've done so much on that issue, and it's important to the governor and myself, and so we thank you. 
and what you know is that the governor has been incredibly supportive of our men and women in law enforcement and one of the areas that I want to thank him as well publicly is creating a criminal interdiction unit and tasking them with Operation Safe Highways. I had the opportunity to ride along with them and see the work that they're doing when they uh, are traversing our state interstates, our highways, our roadways to keep people safe, in particular on this issue of illegal aliens that are um, perhaps using our roadways to conduct illegal and illicit activities. And so I think we all agree that what is happening in this country is just incomprehensible. I don't know how, at what point it became acceptable to uh, basically snub the rule of law and, and be derelict in your duties to protect Americans, in this case here in, in the state of Florida. And so what I'll tell you is that Governor DeSantis does not stand by. He does not uh, cross his arms and put his hands up in the air. He takes action. And by doing that, he's protecting Floridians. He's protecting our country. And so he leads not only by word but by deed. And the legislation he's signing today is just another example of how he's continuing to focus on this issue. And as he mentioned, he's done so much already, and one of the areas that I want to applaud him is impaneling a statewide grand jury that's been investigating criminal networks and making sure that we're addressing this issue um, from the perspective of a criminal grand, uh, grand jury and the work that they're doing. Uh, what I'll say is we've received six presentments thus far, and these interim reports shed more and more light on the utter failures of the Biden administration to protect the border and to keep people safe. And what we've learned really is sobering, and it is the cause of much outrage, especially for those of us that care about law and order. And in the words of the grand jury themselves, Floridians are almost dangerously naive and unaware of the magnitude and the malevolence of the illegal, Im the illegal immigration industry. And they aptly point out, um, as the governor talked about cartels, how cartels are exploiting our border. They're using people and children as commodities. They're bringing into this country dangerous criminals, dangerous weapons, and dangerous drugs. So much so, they've seized enough fentanyl to kill upwards of a billion people. They also uh, have NGOs that are receiving taxpayer dollars that are facilitating and assisting with illegal immigration, um, turning a blind eye to the dangerous track and, and to all the dangers that come into this country. Uh, they have also have the federal government bureaucracy is complicit and they are rushing to release children to unvetted um, and unrelated sponsors. And since Biden came into office, we've seen over 10 million people across our border, more population than 40 states in this country. So all of these statistics are alarming, they're shocking, they're sobering, and it really is shameful to see that illegal immigration, the industrial complex, um, because it is a, an industrial complex, it is alive and well, and it's a booming business. In Miami-Dade County, what we've seen is the immigration courts are facing the largest backlog of any court in this country with 10 percent of the overall immigration cases, further proof that Florida is indeed disproportionately affected by illegal immigration. And what's worse is that the overwhelming majority of those cases that are being um, uh, addressed by the court, more than 90 percent of them lose their asylum claim. Um, so again, the Biden administration is single-handedly responsible for this crisis, and we need to put an end to it. So that's why I'm so proud to stand alongside a governor that stops at nothing to protect Floridians. He's taken action, um, so much so that, that what you've seen is Florida is leading the way. Florida is a trailblazer on so many issues, but this issue in particular, and the support that we've offered um, those border states, but obviously with the focus on Floridians. Um, so I want to thank the governor for prioritizing law and order every step of the way and for his leadership in keeping Floridians safe. Thank you all very much. Okay. Attorney General. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here with us today to celebrate this milestone in Florida. Certainly this is a significant achievement by our legislature. Thank you for everyone here today who is shining a light on the challenges we face in this country. As you heard from the Lieutenant Governor, who's been a great Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much, and for highlighting the work of our statewide prosecutors and the Florida Grand Jury, who upon the direction and insistence of Governor DeSantis launched an investigation as to what was happening with transnational criminal organizations and how it was affecting Florida, those children that were being smuggled across the border, what we were seeing in terms of illegal immigration and the disastrous consequences of this president, and what we found 
is that you heard the numbers, 10 million people, 7 million of which we know came across the border because they were said welcome, processed right in, and then millions more that we never had contact with, smashing historical records. And what we know is that criminals have come into the country as a result of that breakdown in border security, which has been intentional and it has been since day one since President Biden has been in office. This governor recognized that this was going to be a real problem for the security and safety of our communities. We immediately started litigating against this administration, especially in the first month when our sheriffs told us that this administration had backtracked on all former policies and said, we're not going to deport those here illegally, committing serious crimes, committing felonies. I know everybody used to do that, but not under the Biden administration. That left our sheriffs and our police chiefs and our state officers on the front lines combating people here, committing crimes that should never have been here. The breakdown of the border, throwing open the gates, has allowed those criminals to infiltrate our country. Do not take my word for it as Attorney General. Take the grand jury's word for it. Take Director Ray's testimony this week in which he said, we know there is no doubt criminals have come into our country, are coming into our country, criminals related to transnational criminal organizations. In fact, even those organizations that have ties to ISIS. That was this week. This week, we also heard from a sheriff in South Florida who said we had a girl raped by three people here illegally. One came over at the beginning of this month right across our border. And that is because the wide open border. Now, you heard the governor say it's not just the wide open border that's putting our community members at, say, at risk. It's also the programs that Biden has created. Never been done before, but now if you're in another country, he will bring you straight here. They've brought hundreds of thousands of people directly into our country and paroled them into the U.S. And as Governor DeSantis just said, we're already learning about those who are committing crimes. There is no doubt our country is left safe. Not a day goes by that you don't see someone that has been harmed by someone here illegally that should not be here, was not vetted when they came across, or they just escaped all detection because this is a historical surge. In fact, there are even mass release quotas by this administration. How would our personnel ever be able to keep up with that? And these programs that have been created, which are totally unlawful, we have fought every step of the way. We have been in court litigating to push back on these illegal programs. With the support of Governor DeSantis, he's been fighting ever since, not just about not deporting those here illegally committing crimes, but to stop these unlawful programs. We can't even deal with the ones coming across the border. Why are we bringing more unvetted into the U.S.? It is untenable. This governor has done more than any other governor in this country to lead efforts like the bills that we are signed today. I would like to thank Bernie Jock, Kyan uh, Michael, Melanie Bell, Rachel Plakin. The legislative leadership for these bills has just been remarkable. They fought for these. They were on the floor for hours fighting for these bills. And particularly the one that's going to enhance the penalties from those that re-enter after being deported that are committing crimes against our citizens. They will also enhance penalties for those committing crimes here that are tied to transnational organizations. Our prosecutors worked with the statewide grand jury, and that was a direct recommendation from the statewide grand jury to our legislative leaders to say, please strengthen our laws to make it harder for those here are coming with a criminal intent to do harm for Floridians. This will make an enormous difference. And what I want everyone here to know is that state leaders shouldn't have to be passing laws or fighting a court in court against our president to keep our communities safe. This is remarkable. This has never happened. We have a president who does not care what is happening or the affect on Americans or Floridians in terms of their family and community safety. And it's not just that he doesn't care. 
He is actively fighting states that are trying to do their work for them. He has battled Texas to take down the barriers they have put up. He has battled Florida when we've asked them, don't release criminals back into our communities. He has battled Florida when we said, please stop the mass releases so that we can make sure that our country is safe. Today, he is battling us in court. We just battled him this week and got a negative adverse decision and we're gonna have to appeal our president who fights us as this news comes across the wire. And so not as attorney general, not as someone who has worked with this great governor or our sheriffs across the state that has seen the devastation to families and communities as a result of these policy decisions, as a, as a mother, as a wife of a law enforcement officer, I plead directly to our president, and I don't mean to make light of this, but put down whatever you are doing. This is not a partisan issue. These are people that are coming together in communities that have lost loved ones, that are feeling the dangerous effects directly a result of your decisions as to the security of this country. Pay attention, reverse course, secure this border. Listen to the director of the FBI. Listen to the families that have lost loved ones. Listen to the Floridians who want safe communities and have to rely on a state government to defend borders when that is the responsibility of the President of the United States. Put down the ice cream cone, pay attention, and let's save lives. Thank you, Governor DeSantis. I got Grady always has some visual aids, so I'm just getting a little bit of a sneak preview of being able to see what he's got cooking. So. Thank you, Governor. You know, the Governor would be disappointed in me if I didn't have these cards. And you never want your Governor disappointed in you. It is truly my honor for you to be here today, Governor. And when you look at these men and women who stand with us, they are on the front lines. They're the ones keeping the people of Polk County, and there's ones just like them across the state and nation trying their dead level best to keep people safe. But we have to follow the law. And we wouldn't have the laws to do what we do without great governors such as you. And you are the man who's made such a positive difference, and you sent the message loud and clear we're going to keep Polk County safe. We're going to keep Florida safe. We want the world to be safe, and especially the United States. But listen, I'm going to bring this down. You've heard the governor and our attorney general, who I think the absolute world of. Who, go ahead and leave that down there. That's, that's right. That thing driving me crazy. And beside that, I've got my star up here now, okay? So. So it's an important. I'm going to get this right down to the lowest common denominator. You heard the governor eloquently stay, say what he's doing to protect Florida, and he's doing all that he can to protect us. But look, for those of you in Congress and the executive branch, this is a secure border. This is an unsecure border. Everybody knows the difference except for the executives and the Congress, who are absolutely, totally tone deaf. Now, for those of you who are slow learners, this is a secure border. This is another picture of an insecure, unsecure border, both. Folks, they're coming here not just to find a better way of life, like many of our forefathers did, but they're coming here to kill our people while they make enormous profits. And one example is fentanyl. Look at this. 377,000 people have died in this country since 2018 from fentanyl overdose deaths alone. And where did they come from? The fentanyl's coming from Mexico. We worked a large operation here. We found that the fentanyl had gone to Compton was in a house in Compton. It came directly from Mexico to Compton. We bought two kilos of fentanyl undercover. We flew out there. Law enforcement there wouldn't help us enter the house. They don't knock on doors. 
The criminals are winning in California. The criminals are winning in New York. Governor DeSantis says the criminals are not going to win in Florida. And we're going to make sure we carry out those directions. <laughs> Last week, you saw this card. We arrested 228 people in a human trafficking operation, and we rescued folks. Then there was this 21 people that were here illegally that we arrested out of the 228. Listen to me. Nine percent of all of the arrests in this one operation by these law enforcement agencies in one county, 9% were here illegally. And guess what? We also had victims, victims from other countries. That's right. We had victims that came here. You know how these folks got here? The feds flew them for free. So we had victims that were victims of human trafficking that were here from Venezuela. The federal government flew them to New York, gave them some type of certificate. We asked them, what happens? Well, this guy comes with us to make sure we show up and do what we're supposed to. And then he takes us to the next and the next. And we go, well, how do you get there? They said, uh, they told us this. Well, we fly for free. We fly, well, they fly for free, but you and I are paying for it. It's very frightening to me, folks. And then here's what people, some of the mainstream media, some of the politicians, some of the elites are telling us every day, and they're saying this often enough, hoping we'll believe it. What they're saying is they tell us there isn't a border crisis. Have you all heard that? There isn't a border crisis. I say BS. So I've got a BS flag. So I, I throw the BS flag on that. <laughs> then they tell us the border is secure. <laughs> BS. It's not secure. Then they tell us, oh, the illegal immigrants that are here aren't committing crime at any greater rate than American citizens that commit crime. Well, listen, if they weren't here, they couldn't commit any crime, right? <laughs> They're committing hundreds of thousands of crimes, and that's just the ones we're arresting them for. So I throw the BS flag on that. <laughs> Listen, folks, the bottom line to all this is we have a governor, we have a wonderful legislature that's given us all the tools we can to protect the people of the state of Florida. But the people of the United States deserve the same protection, and they deserve the same support. So, Governor, you have to deal with a whole lot of BS. <laughs> so, I've got you, your very own, personally autographed oh, man. BS yeah. flag, okay? So, now, I, I think this would go for a lot on eBay. <laughs> with Grady's signature on it. So, as I wrap up, Folks, we're so fortunate to live in Florida where we have a leader that shows leadership every day. We have a legislature that gets it. We have an attorney general that's the very best, and she works with our office on a lot of long-term investigations. In fact, General, we're in the process of seeking out some people today that some of your team has worked with us on. So God bless the United States of America. And listen, we've got to send a message not just across this state, but across this nation, the people have a right to be safe. So our next speaker, you know, I talked about where we were on all these issues and then what we've been able to do over the last five plus years. And uh, the next speaker is, is now a representative who's helped uh, do some big things in the last year, year and a half. Uh, but was actually with us right, way back in 2019 as a private citizen uh, supporting our policies to do things like ban sanctuary cities because this is an issue of illegal immigration that, that touched her family and in the most profound way. And so I'm going to uh, invite up Representative Michael from Florida's 16th House District to tell you about it.
well, I'll tell you, it's hard to follow <laughs> Sheriff Judd. I just want to acknowledge our Lieutenant Governor, our Attorney General, Sheriff Judd, Bernie Jock. Oh, I'll tell you, we fought a good fight. I pulled you aside because I'm like, um, I think that they are just crazy. Help me here. <laughs> and Representative Plakin and Representative Bell, and especially to you, Governor, because you, you're, you know, I was driving here and I was thinking back in 2019, I had no idea I would be running for office. And here you were reaching out and you wanted to hear from my husband and our daughters here and the, and the little boy over here acting up. That's our only grandchild. <laughs> so we give him a lot of grace. <laughs> and you wanted to hear about our Brendan. And for those of you all that, that don't know my story, our 21-year-old son, Brandon Randolph Michael, and we're from Jacksonville, Florida, was uh, on his lunch break, and he was just going, typical, 21-year-old, going to catch his paycheck on his lunch break, and a twice deported. That's why this legislation is so important. These bills are so important and why they're so dear to me. A twice deported illegal alien that had been in Jacksonville at least seven years that we know of hit our child. He could not read the signs. People want to give them driver's licenses. I don't know if they've thought about, they probably cannot read our signs. Who could not read the sign that he was not supposed to make a U-turn at that particular location in Jacksonville. Ran into our, ch our child, caused his car to flip, and he killed him. And then he got out of the car and watched him take his last breath. And because he got out of the car, we were forced as a family that's already traumatized because I just told him, I'll see you when you get back. You need to have oatmeal. But that's what mamas do. And now someone's telling me he's gone. Every parent's nightmare. You never want to hear anything like that. Never expected that. He was totally healthy. He was engaged to be married. And he was looking forward to his future. He loved the Dallas Cowboys. Didn't care for the Jaguars too much, but. <laughs> And now we are forced to go to court. We're victimized again because now the state had to prove that that illegal alien was in the car. And he came through the southern border, same one that we're still having problems with today. And after all of the, all of the battles and weeks of having to sit there and look at the person that took my child's life that should have never been in this country, he was only sentenced to two years, deported for the third time and he's probably back in our community. So when 2020 happened and I knew that Biden was gonna do exactly what he said he was gonna do, as a mama, that mama bear rose up in me. I'm gonna run for office because nobody's gonna beat me arguing why our borders need to be and have to be closed. And nobody has been able to beat me. And I'm just getting started, I'll tell you that. I'm not going to stay long, but I want to thank you because, you know, while New York is just now discovering, well, maybe this whole sanctuary city idea wasn't too good after all, you were already ahead of them. And I remember as a private citizen, I was sitting uh, in the committee room and I could hear all of the other people saying there is no such thing as sanctuary cities. The governor was in, you were insistent. And we fought hard and they passed it and we're in a much better place because you were decisive, you were quick, you, you recognized what was going on, you didn't waste time, you've taken a lot of flight, and I tell you, I, I take it personally, I get up there and that, you know, I'm in committee and I'm sitting in that chamber and I'm hearing this stuff and I'm like, ooh, <laughs> I just wanna kiss somebody <laughs> because they're talking about my governor, who's an awesome, awesome man, not just a man of God, a, a family man, uh, not just a governor, but you're also to us, you're protective. You care about Floridians. I mean, it makes a difference. I speak from the heart. I don't have anything scripted. I speak from the heart and what I say. And when we were battling over some of these bills, and these, I, I, especially the identification bills, you know, and I'm hearing people say, well, you know, they, the law enforcement likes them. And I'm like, is that true? <laughs> How, why would they want people who are not here illegally? 
to have uh, ID. Why are they feeling as though they have the same rights and privileges as American citizens or people who did it right to come into this country, who waited in line, and they're proud to be American citizens? They should not have the same rights. And so I'm proud today to stand here and say that I'm going to witness this important legislation being signed. And I thank God for you. I thank God for your family. I thank God for all the sacrifices, all of you all. We're, we're very blessed to have you all. Florida is the best state to live in. I'll tell you what, I, I, we don't even like living, leaving the state, do we? We're like, we ain't leaving Florida, wherever we go, wherever we go on vacation. And, and just as I wrap up a short story, my husband and I were in southern Florida just uh, a few months ago, and we were driving back to Jacksonville. We got hit from behind. We exchanged information. There was no damage to the car. That's what we do, right? We get back to Jacksonville, I show it to our sheriff's office. They look immediately at the license plates of this person. He's like, that's not a real license. Then they ran the information. That person doesn't exist. So this is real. It is happening. You've heard it so many before me. So many people before me, you've heard this. But my entire purpose here today, and when I go back to Tallahassee, is to make sure that no other mother, not another father, no other family has to endure what we've had to do. And I know that it's happening. I know that we're trying to slow it down. We're trying to do everything we can. But I'll tell you what, without the best governor that there is, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. And, and I'm very grateful. I'm honored. And thank you so much. Okay, now we're also going to hear from somebody that's been uh, touched uh, in a very profound way uh, by this issue. Uh, we have uh, Nikki Jones. Good morning. <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of my husband, Shane Jones. He lost his life to an illegal alien drinking and driving back in 2019. Um, the illegal alien that killed my husband had multiple high-risk high traffic violations in between Hillsborough County and Polk County, um, including DUIs um, and traffic crashes involving property damage. ICE was never, ever contacted on any of those instances. He was even granted to attend DUI school in the state of Florida with his first DUI conviction back in 2013. And he was able to find comfort uh, to live in Hillsborough County without any harsh consequences of his high risk traffic violations. My husband was a 21 year veteran that just retired a year prior when he was killed. That left me to raise our two daughters alone. At the time of his death, they were six months old and two years old. I am in support of these Im immigration bills being placed because if they were in place and upheld prior to my husband being killed and immigration law was followed through, I believe he would be alive today and my children would still have their father. But instead, we're sitting here today and my children are forced to live and get raised in a broken home. I only want to speak, I not only want to speak on behalf of my family and children, but on behalf of all families in the state of Florida and the United States that have fell victim to illegal alien crimes. Not only are the families in this country being destroyed by high risk traffic violations on a daily basis, but also in drug, sex, and child trafficking crimes. My husband did not serve the, his lifetime for this country and serve wartime on behalf of our country to just be killed on his own soil by, by a person that was illegally here that had multiple opportunities to be removed and wasn't. Shane would have wanted our families to feel safe and not have our families and children destroyed at the hands of illegal alien crimes. In many cases, could have been 100% avoidable if laws, bills, and policies were in place and upheld. 
I want to thank Governor Ron DeSantis, Representative Michael, Representative Jocks, Florida Attorney General Moody, and Sheriff Grady Judd to allow the voices of victims of illegal alien crimes to be heard and recognized and supported. We are the voices that are often silenced, and I thank you for not only the support, but taking action on behalf of the families and children of these senseless, avoidable crimes. So we're going to uh, make this official momentarily. You know, part of it also, I mean, we've, you've heard a lot of, I think, I think really powerful uh, stories about how the criminal activity has devastated families. And, you know, when you have a situation where someone like Cayenne is losing a son or when you have uh, Nikki losing a husband, I mean, those are bells that can't be undone, unrung. And, uh, and those are permanent scars. And, and, and that's just um, uh, the, the reality that these families are now having to live with. Uh, of course, there's other criminal activity that's done that may be short of that, but that is still devastating. Of course, we've talked about the drugs coming in and how people are dying, and they're really being poisoned by fentanyl because you'll go out and people will think they're taking some pill, which maybe they shouldn't be taking, but it's laced with fentanyl, and that could be enough. So that's been devastating. But it's also the case just to have a free and orderly society, the sheer number of people that have poured in, even if it was all legal, you can't take in 10 million people like this. It overwhelms schools, it overwhelms health care, it overwhelms all the resources that are supposed to be dedicated to helping American citizens. And what Biden's administration does is he's really put people here illegally at the front of the line. You know, they can fly around this country without having identification. You would never be allowed to do that with TSA and all this other stuff. They'll put them up in hotels and pay for the hotels uh, in ways that they wouldn't do for American citizens. And so I think what these bills will do, yes, someone comes and, and commits a crime after being deported. They're going to have the book thrown at them. That's good. Uh, we're ensuring that these local governments can't recognize any of these rogue out-of-state licenses, uh, making sure it's you know, driving without a license is going to be treated very seriously if you're here illegally. I I think it's, it's, it's all good. It will reduce criminal aliens for sure, but I think it'll also just be a disincentive that, that Florida, you know, we probably have as many foreign born as a percentage of any state, but, but we want people to do it right. Um, and, and we don't want to have a massive number of people pouring. Look, we've got people coming pouring into the state from, from Illinois and New York and California as it is, and that's legally. You know, we can't have uh, an influx beyond that. We just wouldn't be able to accommodate it. So I think that this will help recognize that just a massive number of people pouring into a country, that just doesn't work. Uh, and it's been really, really devastating to a lot of these jurisdictions. You know, they said they were sanctuary jurisdictions, so they were totally willing to talk the talk. Now when it's time to walk the walk, they're singing a much different tune. So we don't want to be in that situation. We're not a sanctuary state. We do not allow sanctuary cities. And we're adding to what, you know, when, when even the New York Times is admitting that our bills from last year were the strongest in the country, you know we must be doing things right. All right, let's go. You guys want to come up? You want to come up here? Come on up here and help us out. You guys want a pen? All right. So this first one is going to be um, driving without a valid license. And today is the 15th. You guys, you got it? Yeah, come on over here. All right, All right that one's done. You guys want a pen? You want one? You want one? You want one? You want one? Yeah, just be careful. You know, we used to do the water time. Uh, anyone else want one? The moms are like, don't give them to the kids. <laughs> do, do we have the non-permanent? <laughs> um, all right, so this is the one to ensure that um, local governments can't. We, we've already banned them from issuing um, IDs to people here illegally. This uh, ensures that they cannot accept ID issued in another jurisdiction. Like California, 
one, New York or Illinois. All right, so that's that. All right, what do we got? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got Oh! <laughs> Moms, if you want to trade in the permit, <laughs> right here. I'll just take that. All right. Good deal. And then this is the uh, criminal penalties for people that are committing crimes after they've already been deported from this country previously. All right. There we go. All right. Jocks? All right. Anyone else? Any of the deputies want one? Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, looks like we've got here, here. I think I can do it. And here. There we go. All right. Good job. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do you want to have one of these? That's for, for kids. That may be better for kids. <laughs> I'll let your, your mom decide which one that you can keep and which one you can't keep. Um, well, well, look, this is, this is great policy. I want to thank the legislature for, for moving forward with this. Uh, we've been, I mean, this is really, we've got more legislation that we'll be signing. We'll be highlighting things in the budget over the next uh, weeks and months. But this was a great session for law and order. You know, we signed the legislation a couple weeks ago saying that the grand jury materials in Palm Beach from the Epstein uh, investigation, that those are going to be made public finally after all this time. You know, nobody's been held accountable. Uh, you know, Epstein is dead. And then you have Maxwell. And w is that the only people that did anything wrong? I find that very hard to believe. And yet the way that was handled uh, back then and more... So I think people deserve the truth. So we're doing that. You have these uh, package of bills on the on the illegal immigration, really, really strong. We're going to be signing some good stuff uh, next week uh, that's going to help uh, keep communities safe. There's great things in the budget. We have our $5,000 signing bonus for new, off new officers and new deputies. Any of you come from other states? Do we have any transplants um, that, that are here from us? Or are you guys all local? from here. I think we got the low. But you you brought in people, um, and, and it's been a great success story to have folks that aren't necessarily being treated well in some of these other jurisdictions. They can come to Florida, obviously get treated better, have better policies, but then to get a $5,000 signing bonus is a token of our support that, uh, that we care, and we understand that what you're doing is important to our community. So I'm excited about today. But I'm also excited about uh, the wins we're going to be able to put on the board in the ensuing uh, weeks and months. This was uh, really, really good. And we've talked about our crime rate being at 50-year low. We've had a 30 percent decline in retail theft since I've been governor. A lot of these other places, it's like legalization of shoplifting, totally the opposite. Uh, so there's been a lot that's been good, but we want to continue uh, to move the ball forward and get the job done. So, so thanks to everyone that helped made this made this possible. Uh, this is a good day uh, for for the state of Florida. With that, I could take a couple questions. Governor, Governor, uh, I have a question here. Bobby Scott, your administration. Uh, the Coast Guard has told us there's no change in irregular migration in the Florida Straits or Caribbean right now. So, why activate additional officers now? Why call it a potential invasion? Be because y you want to be proactive. We are proactive. We can wait to get overwhelmed and then do something, or we can say we're seeing the possibilities. We've already done things. Uh, we've always supplemented. My executive order of January of 2023 was additional supplement, which really has helped. I mean, the fact that we've done just since January of 23, these are Florida interdicting 670 illegal boats, 13,561 illegal aliens on those boats. I mean, that's a huge amount. Imagine if all those came to Florida just there. And that's not even counting what the Coast Guard has interdicted on their own. So these get turned over. So we've got a good footprint. This expands it. But we want to be prepared. It's the same thing we do when we do hurricanes. Uh, we will mobilize stuff. And sometimes those resources end up not being needed. But I would much rather do that 
and then have it not be needed than to say, well, we knew this was a possibility, but we just didn't want to do. So we're using uh, all the tools at our disposal here. Uh, I think it's already had a big impact in Florida. Um, I do think, though, uh, what, your, what your assessment is true. We have not seen that, which I think is a good thing. I think part of it is they know they're likely not to get through. But I think it's also the fact that they know that the surest route to the United States is to just get to Mexico and then come across the border. And that probably wasn't true uh, 20 years ago, even though we've always had border problems. But the way it's been open now has just been been a disgrace. And so people are obviously going to going to do that. So so we're forward leaning on this. Uh, we think it's important. And uh, that's just going to be the way we roll in the state of Florida. Uh, stay tuned on that. Uh, that's not a bill that um, that I've uh, processed quite yet, but they'll obviously we're, we're going to be moving on that soon. And uh, my my v the goal is we do not want to become like San Francisco or Los Angeles, where these homeless encampments overwhelm daily life for for citizens, and it, it creates a safety hazard. There's drugs. Obviously, there's a lot of mental health issues that go along with that. It hurts businesses. And, and we're just not going to do that. And so it's going to be a requirement for municipalities and counties to make sure they keep their public parks and streets clean and safe uh, and not allow that to impinge on the quality of life of their citizens. Now, there's problems associated with why it gets to that point, such as mental health, that, that I've said I, I'd be willing to help out with. So, so we will be uh, looking at ways to, to be effective. But I think the, the key that we'll be able to say from state policy is we're basically saying in the state of Florida, a municipality or county is just simply not allowed to embrace San Francisco style policies. Uh, you can make other choices, but you can't make that choice. Why? Because every time that choice has been made, uh, the result has been destructive, and we don't want that in the state of Florida. Yeah, yes, I mean, I think that that, you know, I had issues with the first version. There was a number of reasons. But part of it is federal law already says under 13 you're not allowed to have an account. Now, that's not being enforced. So we're going to have teeth to that. And then for the, the folks that are a little older than that, like 14, 15, it's going to be, okay, you can't get an account without your parents' permission. So we're empowering parents to be able to make those decisions. I've said for many years social media is a net negative on our society. I think it's a net negative on children. But I also wanted parents to have a seat at the table and not just say if someone's a freshman or sophomore in high school, that even if the parent wanted to authorize limited use, that we wouldn't provide that option. So I think that that's a good balance there that's being struck. But the stuff for the young kids, that is already, you know, you have this the, the issue with the TikTok stuff where you have eight and nine-year-olds calling Congress saying uh, with TikTok, the thing is, they're not allowed to have accounts under federal law. It just isn't being enforced. So we're going to enforce that, uh, and I think it's good. And what they, ha what they did was it's not even about the content, even though there's, there's problematic content. It's about the functionality, the certain things that have addicted qualities that really draw the kids in and get that. that, that I, so I think what it does is it's really empowering parents the way it's structured. And the first bill didn't quite do that. And so we felt that we, they needed to do um, a little bit more for that. But look, I'm a, uh, I'm a dad. I got first grade kindergarten and pre-K three. And all three of my kids have mentioned things like Instagram and Snapchat. When they do not get that in our home, uh, we don't have it on, I mean, on our devices. They don't, they don't use it. Uh, but but they, their, their schoolmates talk about it. These are things that are talked about. So I don't think it's healthy to have elementary school kids, uh, you know, on these phones all day. And, you know, one of the things we did last legislative session, uh, 23, when we did the Teachers' Bill of Rights, one of the things that we did to help teachers was say, schools can tell kids that you have to check your phone at the front of the classroom and actually sit in class and learn and not be on your device the whole time. And the districts that have done that have reported everyone's a lot happier by doing that. And so this, is, this bill is part of that, how you deal with schools. I think there's a lot, but, but we really want our kids, uh, I think, to, to not just be wedded to a handful of social media apps. I don't think ultimately that's something that is going to be healthy 
uh, for our society as our kids grow up and their kids mature. And the thing is, with parents, I want parents at the table. I want the I wanted to have the parental consent element to that. But at the same time, uh, to just say, well, parents should just be able that they should be able to control everything. As a parent, you just can't control everything. Uh, there's all kinds of things that are there. And so I do think parents, you know, would, would appreciate some support so that this is structured in a way that increases their chance of having successful outcomes with their kids. So, so that's really what we're looking at. And I'd also just point out, uh, and I've been one that's been saying, you know, not every use of social media is bad. There's kids that use it. There's, there's kids that have, have learned from it and stuff like that. You have to acknowledge that. But, and I think Grady would, 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 would echo this, social media is like a predator's best friend. I mean, when they're going after minors, if they can get on social media and have access, oh, man, that, that's, that's all that they want to do. And that's very, very destructive. And when I was growing up, you know, a, a predator could be in the neighborhood and try to do something, which was obviously a problem. But now a predator can be in your home virtually uh, on a social media account talking directly to a 12 or 13-year-old kid. Uh, that's a huge, huge problem. Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, if I could just wave a magic wand, obviously we would love to see. So, uh, but what we did with uh, the legislative leadership in 2022, so even before they took over, they passed a big uh, reform of the market. You now have seven companies that have actually come in. Uh, you have a huge depopulation of citizens. And interestingly, uh, there's a big chunk of the people that were taken out of citizens that actually have lower rates than they had under citizens, uh, which you can believe that. So, so that's, that's, that's progress. What we did in this budget was provide the My Safe Florida Home, so over $200 million where people can apply for grants. And this is for middle-income and low-income homeowners. You can apply for a grant, uh, and you can get two-thirds of the repair or the improvement through the grant. So you do that, and the people that have gone through the program, 70% have had either a reduction in rate or a stabilization in rate. Uh, and, and that's a huge investment, and we've done that now three years in a row. That's proven uh, to be successful. Uh, but ultimately, you got to have people that want to come in and do business in the state. They didn't really want to do that as much prior to these reforms. I think those reforms have seen more capital come in, but it's ultimately a private market, um, and you've got to do that. So, yes, I will ask, you know, I'd love for people, uh, for them to, to offer, you know, a dollar a year or, or whatever, but, but the government can't can't uh, set that. It just doesn't, that's not how a market works. So we have more people in the market now. Um, I think that that's been a good thing. The legislature also um, gave everyone a one-year holiday on the insurance tax that goes on the homeowner's policy. Not saying that that's going to necessarily mitigate everything, but every little bit helps uh, with that. And so, so that is something that we'll sign into law uh, with respect uh, to the tax package. I do think there's other companies that are looking to enter Florida's market. Uh, and if you think about how much insurance has gone up nationwide in a lot of these other states, um, you know, you've had a lot of companies flee over the last couple of years, like a California here because of what the legislature did. You actually have people coming in uh, to the market, and that's what you need. If you don't have that, if you only have one or two options, then they're never, ever going to be in a situation uh, where you're going to be able to shop for more competitive rates. It's not authorized by law. That, that is an abuse of the parole. The parole in, in federal law is very limited. Ashley has gone to, to court, and we've actually won victories on Biden's abuse of parole in the Northern District of Florida. So for him to do this whole program underneath the parole, it just doesn't work. So you're bringing somebody in, like they brought in the guy from Haiti, military age male, He's, he's dumped, I think, in Massachusetts. I think he came in maybe in New York and then ends up in Massachusetts. And then he's now accused of sexually assaulting a 15-year-old. It's like, okay, what the law did not require you to, to bring that person in. You are abusing the law to do that. How is that benefiting the American people? This whole idea of anything we're talking about immigration, uh, it should be what benefits Americans. 
And if it doesn't benefit Americans, then, then you should not be doing it. So I think what he's done is, is, um, is not consistent with the law. But I think his abuse of parole is something that he's done since 2021. That is not the reason that was there. He's effectively changing the law uh, without co congressional consent. But I'd also say this, um, you know, as a Republican, I hear these Republicans in Washington, you know, they, they rail against the border. They rail against the inflation. And yet next week, they're going to turn around and fund Biden, bo Biden's border policies. They are not going to fund, they are not going to fight to defund his, his programs. You could very easily defund his use of parole. You could very easily uh, mandate construction of a board. There's things that they could do. They haven't even tried to do any of that. So, so they're going to fund, most likely, his policies going forward, and they're likely to spend money at a higher level than even this bad budget deal of last summer called for. What's caused the inflation? It's the borrowing, spending, and printing of money. So I would like to see some action to fight back against these policies. We're doing our part in Florida to fight back, but this is actual legislation. This is actual executive action by mobilizing the resources in southern Florida with the vessels. It's not just going out and pontificating or complaining about it. So you have the power of the purse. If you do not like what Biden is doing on immigration, which I do not, and I think most Americans do not, then choose not to fund what he's doing on immigration. Because you know what? That's why we sent you there. All right, thanks, everybody.